are from Uruguay. Okay, I think we are going to get started. Um, just making sure we're good. Anything else? Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll uh, we'll uh, sort the, the interpretation out uh, while you're busy. Fantastic. Well, I love seeing all the greetings coming into the chat box. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Kathy Feingold. I'm the International Director at the AFL-CIO here in the United States. I also have the honor of being the Deputy President of the International Trade Union Confederation. And it is my honor to welcome all of you from Mauritius and Argentina and all over in Russia, I'm seeing from Fenpar and all over the world. Greetings to everybody. Um, first, let me remind everyone that this is the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women parallel event on the ratification of the International Labor Organization Convention 190 to end gender-based violence and harassment from the world of work. So that is the conversation we're gonna have today. This meeting is being recorded as well as being live streamed. So welcome to everyone who's watching us on live stream as well as here in the webinar. So by way of background, let me uh, remind everyone, um, we have all been very distracted this past year. We've had a pandemic. We have seen rising inequality, the fights for racial and gender justice. We have seen um, the climate crisis really front and center in our lives. So many challenges, but one thing that has not been stopped this year is the organizing that has been happening around the world to win and to ratify the International Labor Organization Convention 190. So let me take us back um, about a year and a half ago. On June 29th, 2019, we celebrated a historic day. It was a day when women and workers, unions and our allies won the first ever international treaty focused on ending violence and harassment in the workplace. Now, whenever we claim a win, we know that this means there had been years of hard work, um, of organizing, of many, many conversations with governments, employers, and our allies about how we would go about moving a new standard. Now, for many years, the global labor movement had been highlighting the problem of gender-based violence but for many years, there had been a resistance to creating a new standard. Some governments like my own at the beginning in the United States said, we don't really need a new standard. We have our own laws. Other countries um, were worried that, uh, you know, they already had high standards that perhaps this could affect the laws they already had in place. So it took a lot of organizing even to get the issue on the agenda at the International Labor Organization. So for years, we organized to highlight the problem, to make visible the problem of gender-based violence in our homes, communities, and workplaces. And we immediately saw the issue as one about power, the imbalance of power between relationships. And the labor movement knows this well, the imbalance of power between workers and our employers, between men and women, and the many other intersections of inequality that come with race, ethnicity, migration status, sexual orientation, and other factors. So the adoption of an international labor organization convention and recommendation was a huge victory for all of us, for workers, the trade union movement, and all of our allies who were critical in helping us push this forward. Under the new instruments, the convention and recommendation states are able to adopt laws, policies, and mechanisms aimed at preventing violence and harassment in the world of work. It protects workers and establishes actual remedies for victims. And there are responsibilities that employers have. Employers have the primary responsibility to create a work envir environment free from violence and harassment. And they also have role, and, and then there are some defined roles for trade unions and workers as well on how to address violence in the workplace. But we know this was just the beginning, that historic day in June in 2019, when many of us were dancing in the, in the rooms of the International Labor Organization. I'm not sure they had seen so much dancing in a long time. Um, now we took this energy 
back home to our countries, to our communities. And now with our allies, unions must campaign for the ratification and the implementation of this convention and take this global treaty and make it a tool for change, transformation in our workplaces and in our lives. So to date, we have Namibia, Argentina, Fiji and Uruguay who have formally ratified the convention. You'll hear from other representatives from countries that have moved this forward like Italy um, that are also very much on the forefront of making this, rea this a reality in our country. So that's by way of background. Um, we're just getting started as a movement of bringing this home and using it as a tool for transformation. So it's my honor today to be with a incredible panel. We have Merdaray Vatije from um, the Youth Committee Chairwoman from the FTUC in Fiji. We have Fiona Gandiwa Magaya, Gender Specialist and Head of Education and the Legal Department of the Zimbabwean Congress of Trade Unions. Silvana Capuccio, responsible for European and International Gender Policy Gender Policies, CGIL Italy, Milagro Pau, Gender Secretary and Executive Committee Member of the PIT CNT of Uruguay, and Krishanti Dharmaraj, Executive Director for the Center for Women in Global Leadership. And then we will have interventions from the floor beginning with Angelica Ordonez from Ecuador. So a great panel. I'm going to turn it over to them right now so that we don't delay. Let's go straight um, to um, uh, Mirai. Let's talk about Fiji. We were so excited to hear the news from Fiji. Tell us a little bit about um, what's been going on there, how the implement implementation of the convention um, and the ratification, what does that mean practically in your country? Big news to hear it was ratified. What's happening in Fiji to bring this home? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Um, big bulavinaka to all the, uh, uh, the speakers here. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, first, in Fiji, we commend uh, the ratification of uh, this very important um, uh, convention. Uh, we were the second country uh, to ratify C-190 in the world. Um, that was a big achievement um, in itself. However, uh, ratification is one thing. The implementation uh, is another process. Uh, what we have done, um, the government and other uh, institutions have done post uh, the ratification process. The uh, Fiji Trades Union Congress uh, has lobbied with the ILO to uh, provide technical support uh, for legislative uh, review here in Fiji. Uh, there is a consultant that uh, look, overlooks the review process. And uh, she, has a, uh, she has prepared a matrix of changes uh, to be made to the uh, local legislation, specifically the Employment Relations Act, uh, which is the principal legislation uh, uh, for labor laws uh, here in Fiji. Uh, so the uh, FDUC has provided inputs to the consultants uh, with the challenges that we face in terms of the implementation and the enforcement of uh, C-190. Uh, ensuring its uh, compliance with the uh, articles of the convention. This is a uh, this is the first phase of a two-phase consultation process, and uh, the second phase involves stakeholders, uh, the representatives from the uh, line ministries uh, and uh, employers, and uh, government has also submitted its uh, comments, uh, and the same will be uh, submitted to the. Uh, uh, Employment Re uh, Relations Advisory Board, the Arab, uh, for the legislative uh, review. Uh, the FTUC specifically is looking at appointing some prominent members uh, of the community uh, as uh, C-190 champions. So uh, we're looking at a member of a parliament who will be advocating for C-190 at various levels. Uh, likewise, we're looking at uh, young and prominent uh, people who can, uh, who have platforms uh, to raise this uh, issue and attract uh, public uh, attention on the same. So uh, basically that, that is what we uh, uh, currently uh, 
doing right now uh, in Fiji and uh, specifically from the uh, Fiji Trade Union Congress uh, point of view. Thank you so much. And I love this idea. One of the, what I hope is that we can all share some best practices as panel of champions um, for the convention ratification and implementation is a, a great idea. Bringing people from uh, outside the labor movement, women's organizations and having high level champions. Let's now go over to Silvana and to Italy that you have been on the forefront of fighting for this in the EU. Um, and this has been such a, a critical um, uh, action for all of you. How can the convention contribute to strengthening the elimination of gender-based violence and harassment in the workplaces in Italy? So maybe start a little bit with the, what you're doing uh, in terms of getting it to the ratification process and then how will this impact um, workers in Italy? Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, this for us was a very important process because this is an issue that uh, is uh, so debated and so present amongst the workers and amongst the Italian citizens. So it was uh, really important and especially at the, the time of uh, the pandemic. So we are very proud of this ratification. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, the, the, the text of the convention was exactly replicated in the law of uh, uh, ratification. So everything was exactly accepted. Nothing is exactly new because in different terms, it is to say via um, two main uh, uh, different tools, but the, the same contents of the norms were already present in our uh, normative system. It is to say, on one side, uh, through the protection of safety in the workplace, which was including also the harassment, and uh, on the other side also uh, um, via the um, anti-discrimination systems uh, which was uh, closely linked to the implementation of uh, the European uh, Union norms. So it was, uh, it was the both. But anyway, we think that it is very important to get the ratification because it can enhance and strengthen the implementation of these norms and the overall system, and especially uh, we, um, we, we uh, want the uh, inspectorate to act and uh, to be reinforced in the prevention of uh, uh, the overall system. Because we had to, to recall that uh, the the uh, risk assessment also in the workplace does include also what is related to the violence and the, uh, the harassment at the psychological and at sexual level. So uh, this uh, allows indeed the, uh, an overall system to, 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 to work uh, as a, a whole. Um, uh, I uh, would like to highlight that um, um, there are uh, some aspects which are especially important. For instance, the employer's obligation uh, to take uh, the necessary measures in order to uh, counter violence, also on preventive basis and in dialogue with the uh, institutions on one side, but with trade unions on the others as well. So uh, this is one of the aspects. Then we have the broad definition, which is uh, one of, uh, uh, we could say, of uh, the real uh, uh, great aspects of the convention, which is uh, the, the, the same we have. But this is very important because it means uh, to strengthen and uh, to create the links between the aspects of domestic violence and the violence in the workplace and to uh, act in order to protect the gender-based violence. Because, well, we know uh, we talk about violence, but when we talk about violence, it is especially violence against, against uh, uh, women. So this as a, a first reply. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Silvana. And I really like, you have highlighted a couple issues that were, were front and center in the debates. One was this link around domestic violence 
And we had a real debate around making the link of this continuum of violence that's that is in women's uh, lives in particular, and um, the the obligation of employers, which also to be preventing this, not just waiting for something to happen. So those are great highlights. I'm going to come back to you because we do have some questions in the chat about the EU state of play. So that will be next round. We'll come back to that. Um, I now would like uh, to turn it over to um, Fiona. We're going to go on to Zimbabwe. And I just have to say, um, we could not have gotten this process over the line had it not been from the block of African countries at the International Labor Organization. Um, this was critical, and I have never seen such organizing in action on the floor <laughs> to make sure that there was no um, backsliding by African governments. And so, Fiona, um, I know that energy continues to this day in Zimbabwe. Um, talk to me a little bit about the, the process, but what is the prevalence of um, sexual and gender-based violence in workplaces in Zimbabwe, and who are most vulnerable? Thank you. Um, can I share my screen or I can just uh, talk like this? Whichever you prefer. If you can easily share your screen, <laughs> please do. All right, let me try. And while Fiona's um, trying to share her screen, I'm just going to give a shout out. I see um, Albania joining us. Great to hear about your work and uh, Spain, Argentina. Okay, over to you, Fiona. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Um, sexual and gender-based violence is very prevalent in the workplace. Uh, in fact, uh, women, um, a one in every three women is a Oh, I think we may have gotten Fiona frozen. Um, okay, we're gonna keep moving and wait for Fiona to come back to us. Uh, this is the wonders and challenges of Zoom and the platform. Fiona, just giving her one more chance. Are you completely stuck here? Uh, I think the internet connection might be bad. So let us keep moving on. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's frozen, I know. Okay, so let us uh, go on to the next speaker and come back to Fiona, who has this great presentation. Um, let's go over to um, uh, Krishan. Whoops, are you back with us, is Fiona? I think we have totally lost her. Um, we are gonna go now to, um, at, to Milagro um, and Uruguay. Let us hear the uh, examples from um, Uruguay. We were all so excited because we know we were following very closely the ratification um, process. So tell us a little bit about um, what's happened post ratification. What does the implementation look like in Uruguay? Bueno, en principio, buenos días. So good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to be with you. For me, it's a real uh, pleasure and uh, to have uh, worked uh, with uh, the trade unions. Uh, and I'm very proud uh, that we've been the first country in the world to have uh, ratified the C-190 convention. I'd like to say hi to our colleagues who have been able to ratify it as well. And I would like to encourage all the others to continue the fight for the ratification so that it is a world thing. The ratification of the convention in Uruguay uh, was a very important uh, moment. Uh, in 2017, we had indeed uh, legislation against uh, gender-based violence. And uh, in a way, it uh, led to modification of the civil code in our country. And the ratification of uh, the Convention 190 was uh, done through the uh, labor ministry and the trade unions. We had a progressive government at the time. And uh, so, it was uh, ratified uh, this convention and we had a law that was uh, adopted to implement it at legislative level because we have to have a national legislation for this convention 
and also for the recommendation. So this was a very important moment. And starting from then, we started our fight so that all the uh, uh, collective bargaining uh, would uh, use these ratifications so that the provisions for collective bargaining would be integrated in the negotiations uh, and also to include the concepts of the recommendation. So this was really a challenge because uh, just after the ratification in Uruguay, there was a change in the government. Uh, and it was more of a neoliberal government. And so we were faced with some problems for the implementation. So we really had to work on the implementation of the recommendations and of the convention. And so it was a totally different kind of work. We had to really give a push to the trade union movement because in a way we were responsible of this implementation. So we have uh, the collective bargaining system that was a bit uh, frozen and for six years we've tried now to include the provisions uh, in the different sectors in the different uh, uh, agreements uh, particularly concerning the family co-responsibility and concerning gender-based violence uh, because we deal not only with uh, the problems at work but also with domestic violence and the impact this violence can have on work so it is really very important to focus on domestic violence uh, for women it is something that should also be reflected afterwards uh, at the level of work as such so we've tried to, to promote uh, um, things so that in each sector it was possible to include uh, these provisions in the companies in uh, the collective bargaining processes uh, and we tried to have uh, tripartite commissions or bipartite commissions to be established to make sure that collective bargaining would indeed respect the recommendations and the convention. So for the moment, we have 85% of the agreements of collective bargaining agreements that have been signed in Uruguay in 2019. That was the last round of agreements of that kind. So we have 85% of the agreements that include violence, uh, um, gender-based violence and uh, the problems of domestic violence included. And we are trying to make sure that all sectors now have uh, committees that are going to make sure that uh, this convention is indeed well implemented because uh, sometimes you can have cases of harassment and uh, the worker who's the victim is the person who is uh, transferred to another place to work. So in fact, she's a victim, but at the same time, she's even more a victim because she's displaced. She has to work somewhere else. So we managed to make sure that the colleagues who would be uh, the victim of uh, harassment wouldn't be victims again. And that uh, the um, perpetrator would be prosecuted. Um, and so it's very important to work as trade unions in that field because we are not talking only about the legislation, but we're talking also about uh, the implementation of this convention. So there is no real political will uh, with the current government, uh, uh, there is no real will to implement uh, politics, politics uh, the policies that are focusing on gender-based violence. Um, now, at the international level, maybe they're going to hear another president uh, who's going to see is on the front line of doing this kind of things. Uh, and then maybe it's going to make the, our president react. Uh, but uh, recently we have uh, seven uh, bargaining uh, agreements that we are discussing for the moment. Of course, it is hindered by the pandemics, but as a trade union, we have to make sure that uh, the Convention 190 is truly implemented. So it is a real challenge. We are all, only one uh, trade union that has to cover all the colleagues. Uh, and uh, essentially the role we have um, is uh, to work as a trade union to make sure that we can monitor the progress. It is urgent to check uh, labor conditions of all our uh, colleagues, of all our women colleagues. So we are now studying what's the possibility to have a discipline committee um, 
it is a, a, a point of contact if people have been harassed at a, a work. So when women have been harassed, they can get in touch with that committee. And for five years, we've also signed a, a statement of our Congress in which we said uh, that uh, there is no place for violence when we are working as trade unions. So three times uh, the courts uh, have been uh, going against uh, some uh, people, some perpetrators. So it's very important to make sure that the recommendations and the convention are implemented, but we consider that to make sure that things are going to progress even more in the future is through the monitoring as a trade union movement so that uh, we can uh, make sure that there is a, a real achievement, that it's not just something on paper, but it is something real. And so we have a, a responsibility, a very strong responsibility as uh, trade unionists. We have a very strong degree of, participati of participation in the tripartite and bipartite uh, committees that have been established in order to make sure that we monitor things uh, and to make sure that uh, work is free from violence and from harassment. And we want to do even more than that. We want to make sure that our responsibility covers also domestic violence, because as I said, it has an impact on the work of our women colleagues. So we cannot separate uh, labor from pr private life. So we have to try and work at both levels. I don't know whether I should continue or if we're going to give the floor to our colleague Fiona, because I've seen. So is it is it over? Just two more words, two more words. Yes, OK, two more words. So I'd like to say hi to you all. It is an honor for me to be with you today. And of course, uh, we are there yet yeah, to uh, give you any information about uh, the legislation we have in Uruguay to help other people also to go through the phase of ratification so that we can have a, a world, a labor world that is free of violence. Choose um, that Uruguay has a model many of us would love to have. Um, first of all, that you have pointed out, indeed, there is always a big gap between what happens, a, a law passes, and then actual enforcement. So this is going to be constant um, uh, monitoring and organizing, and that's a really important point. The second is collective bargaining agreements as what we have as a movement for dealing with this power imbalance. Um, I love hearing that in Uruguay, you have um, these clauses in, into your collective bargaining agreements. That's something here in the United States States we've been looking at, um, we've realized our, our collective bargaining agreement language is quite dated. Um, so we look, that's a great model in, in Uruguay that we hear you're organizing. Um, and I love that you have formed tripartite commissions to really deal with these cases. So some very good models coming out of Uruguay. Thank you. Um, Fiona, lovely to see you back here. Uh, are, are, do you want to, um, are you ready to do your presentation? Yes, I am. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'll do it without sharing because I'm now using my phone. Um, violence and harassment, whilst it affects all people, men and women, um, it is more prevalent in the workplace. And um, one in every three women is actually suffering from violence at a point in their lives. And um, it is more prevalent in that it, 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 is, it makes more uh, women, young people, as well as uh, the, the, the people with disabilities more vulnerable in the workplace. And um, when, we, when you look at violence and harassment, and we look at the, um, the, the drivers of violence and harassment, we see that um, power issues, are the key issues. It's an issue of power wrangle, uh, people that are more powerful socially, economically, and otherwise, they will take advantage of the weaker party and they will abuse other people and traumatize them. And in the workplace, we've got our, our employers, we've got managerial employees who are more uh, economically empowered 
and they can, they've got the authority to hire and fire. Hence, they can use that kind of power against the, the non-managerial workers. Um, in the workplace as well, you will see that um, we have got um, workers, some workers who may succumb to this kind of violence. They succumb to this kind of violence because of poverty, because of fear of being uh, uh, further intimidated or harmed by the perpetrator because of the threats that they may face from the perpetrator. So we do have some people that may succumb to this pressure. And then we have some that may not even report because of the same uh, reasons. And when we look at COVID-19 it, and its impact or, on women, particularly the issue of violence and harassment, we see that women are on the forefront. They have the frontline workers in the health sector. We've got more than 70% as women. We also see that uh, women are occupying most of the precarious jobs that are lowly paid. And when we went to lockdown, women were burdened with the care burden to take care of their loved ones, to take care of those that were sick. So this actually puts uh, women at a higher risk of being infected by COVID-19. And COVID-19 itself is uh, exacerbated or increased the stigma, the discrimination and the violence um, against women. In fact, some women were locked down with their abusers and some even died in the process. And uh, we have got some people who were stigmatized, who had uh, contracted the virus and they faced social stigma. They were even um, rejected by their own families. So this is what uh, COVID-19 has actually done uh, to women. And when we look at the importance of this convention. The convention 190, it protects everyone, all the workers, whether you are in public, private, or rural, or in, informal, you are protected. And it gives us a fundamental right to be protected, to, 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 to enjoy a workplace that is free from violence and harassment. It also protects us from third party violence. When you are at the workplace, a client can even violate you. And the convention covers that kind of violence and harassment. We also are protected from the indirect or direct impact of domestic violence. Whilst domestic violence may be a family related violence, it does have an impact on the workplace. A person can follow you to the workplace and violate you. And we also see that it is very important because it gives extra special protection for the vulnerable groups that are disproportionately affected by violence and harassment. And women are in this category as the most vulnerable. Women has been made vulnerable by culture, by patriarchy, and by society and by poverty. So women are in this category. Of, viol uh, of vulnerable groups and the convention does protect them. So this convention, it gives us opportunity as countries to actually strengthen our legislation in terms of protections for our, our citizens, in terms of protection for the vulnerable groups. It also gives us opportunity to formulate workplace policies that will ensure that our workplaces are free from violence and harassment. So it is a, a powerful convention and it is very important for us to lobby for its ratification and domestication because it is quite a good convention, the first of its kind under the ILO. And for the first time, we are able to deal with violence and harassment, which has been an issue that the whole world has been struggling to deal with, even in communities. So I want to conclude by encouraging that as workers, we, we are supposed to be part of the solution. We are supposed to be part of 
the, the solution to create a workplace that is free from violence and harassment. We need to break that silence, that culture of silence, and encourage people to report, educate, capacitate, and empower women to report violations so that we can indeed enjoy a workplace that is free from violence and harassment. I thank you. Thank you, Fiona, so much that you've put forward to us, making sure we steep ourselves in this moment, the pandemic, the stigma, um, the, the violence that many um, women have found themselves in having to be isolated and at home and experiencing even increased violence and stigma. Um, the fact that this is a framework that I feel like this international treaty, as you mentioned, it it tried to be as inclusive as possible, rural workers, informal workers, all workers are protected. We know many of our labor laws in our own countries have left out many workers. Um, so this, this was our intention, making sure it was as inclusive as possible. We need to take on, I love this culture, patriarchy and poverty, and that uh, workers are always, always part of the solution. So thank you for your powerful intervention. Now, when I talk about um, that you, unions can't do this alone, I just think of Krishanti. Um, I think of the Center for Women's Global Leadership and all that you did to lead on this issue as well, to make sure um, that you were helping the, the labor movement connect with the huge network of women and feminist organizations that have been working on ending violence in our homes, communities, and workplaces for many years. We're grateful for the partnership that we've had to get us to this point and that we continue to have. And so coming over um, to you, Krishanti, just to, um, to start us off a, a little bit about, um, you know, why should feminists and women's rights organizations support the ratification and implementation of this convention? Over to you and welcome. Thank you very much, Kathy. And it is wonderful to go right after Fiona because she really laid the groundwork for me. Um, first of all, it's an honor um, to be part of uh, this conversation. I want to begin by saying that gender-based violence is a pandemic. It is not a hidden pandemic. It is not a shadow pandemic. It is not a soft pandemic. It is a pandemic, right? What COVID did was to amplify that pandemic. And gender-based violence has been the norm in the world. Right. And for those of us who are really committed to eradicating violence in our lifetime, we cannot do that without paying attention to ILO 190. Right. Because violence is an indicator. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's an indicator of discrimination and devaluation of women. And where women are devalued is in labor whether it's formal or informal, paid or unpaid, right? So, and, and that has been formalized in the current economic policies we've had since World War II. So unless we connect the dots between the eradication of violence, devaluation of labor, right? And discrimination against women, Right? We really cannot move forward in the eradication of violence and addressing as it as a pandemic. It's also really important to recognize in the prevention of violence, how important workplaces are. Workplaces are a place of influence. We cannot go into, a, regardless of how much work we do, when it comes to intimate partner violence, we can go into a house to start dictating. We can influence and protect the women. But if we can really enter the conversation of violence against women in the space of work with this particular treaty, right? Then there's a point of influence on social, political, and cultural ways of being. So there is, that is one place where there's somewhat of a level playing field for women. And it is also about equality and non-discrimination that the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women has provided for us. 
And again, ILO 190 takes it further, right? So it allows us really to come together very specifically after, um, you know, a COVID to show that women's labor that is precarious and how it has been impacted is directly related to the increase in violence. So collectively working with unions, worker rights organizations allows us really to address violence in a more proactive and a deliberate manner. Thank you, Krishanti. It's great. And I really want to just emphasize this important link because you take, you sort of brought all of the presentations together around linking um, violence, discrimination, and the devaluation of work. And so why um, this work is so incredibly important to shifting that dynamic, um, that web of, um, of, of problems that we, we all face. Um, and again, um, you know, very grateful for the work you all do each November on highlighting um, the, the issue and role of violence in, in our homes, our communities and workplaces. So we are gonna, I'm seeing a very rich conversation in the chat. We're gonna get to some of your questions. People are asking about, um, you know, strategies and we need some of the uh, best practice models that Milagro, some collective bargaining agreement language. So we're gonna, we're gonna come to that. We're gonna do um, one next round with our speakers and then come to all of these really good um, questions and, and conversation that we're having um, here. So let me go back um, to Fiji. Um, let us uh, uh, go the next step. So you um, have the um, uh, the ratification, um, and you are now um, trying to. You have you've set up your commission. Um, what are some of the challenges that you anticipate in terms of the application of Convention One Ninety? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Uh, what are the, some of the challenges that uh, we uh, anticipate? Um, uh, the backlash from employers in, in terms of new policies. Um, this can be uh, remedied uh, by more consultation, uh, their involvement in the review process, uh, and the assistance by a government in subsidizing costs uh, uh, associated with the change. Um, uh, in this uh, uh, difficult time that we're in, uh, the middle of a pandemic, uh, COVID-19. Uh, most people are either worried uh, about the job losses, putting food on the table. Um, in a way, they have pushed this issue about uh, violence against uh, women and girls and harassment. They pushed it down the ladder. It has not become a priority for some. Uh, that, that is also one of the, uh, the concern that we have. Um, the other thing is uh, COVID-19 continues to uh, expose um, violence and harassment uh, against women and girls. Uh, for Fiji, um, uh, the um, Fiji Women's Rights uh, Movement, uh, they had a um, uh, had conducted a, uh, a research uh, and uh, they found that one in uh, every five girls, uh, uh, women, sorry, uh, were harassed uh, at their workplace. So it is a very uh, uh, prevalent and an urgent issue for us uh, here in Fiji. And uh, the, the other challenge is the victimization uh, of uh, women and girls who speak up about uh, uh, violence and harassment uh, at, at their workplace. So these are some of the uh, challenges that, uh, that we anticipate in terms of the, the application of um, uh, Convention uh, 190. So yeah, these are just uh, some of the, uh, the challenges uh, that we are anticipating at the moment. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Silvana, I know we'll get to some questions because there's a, some questions in the chat box about the EU strategy, but I wanna just do one more before we get to the larger EU strategy, which I think is really important. Um, why is the ratification of C-190? We heard that Krishanti kind of said that gender-based violence is a pandemic unto itself. So we have sort of, we, it's just being exposed even more in this time of pandemic. Um, why is the ratification of, of this convention so important to ensuring, ensuring a, a response and recovery um, from, from our COVID-19 pandemic? 
Yes, uh, well, I, I begin replying to the people who sent their, their questions on the EU. Well, indeed, yes, now there is this objection saying that the, the uh, EU Council should uh, decide giving an, a sort of authorization. Well, it's something really new. Uh, Italy has a, a very high number of ratification of the ILO standards, and we have never heard about it. So it's uh, it's a new. Uh, my personal opinion, but uh, obviously we need to uh, make more inquiries about this, is that uh, there is no uh, real Real legal uh, uh, foundation on this, but uh, uh, I think that is uh, only a political objection which is raising and which uh, represent in the reality an obstacle. Uh, as you see, there is uh, an anonymous uh, um, uh, person who makes the question, but are the other EU countries free to fully ratify? Oh, yes, they are absolutely free. We are talking about um, uh, international standards. So, and, and we are talking about the decisions of the uh, national parliaments, which are fully sovereign to decide and to approve, to adopt uh, the laws. So we are sovereign to decide, but there is this raising uh, objection and uh, we should uh, we should be very careful about it because uh, as all of us know well, when we talk about laws, labor laws and the labor laws impacting directly on women, you can measure really the state of democracy everywhere. So we must be very vigilant. Then uh, I go very quickly because of the timing. The other question, the question would deserve much more time, but I can say that the COVID, uh, indeed the, the, the COVID-19, the situation of the pandemic has stressed, has increased the situation of uh, uh, violence for many reasons uh, because of the isolation at home uh, for sure so uh, women who were forced to live together with violent partners and in a situation of silence of forced silence and uh, uh, for women in the front lines, uh, we have to think about uh, uh, the nurses, uh, the healthcare, uh, uh, again, a big uh, uh, exposure at the situation of uh, risks, and also for all the uh, people who have no home. Uh, we have to think about the homeless or also the undocumented migrants or the refugees and not always, or we could say very seldom, they are provided with the new rights to be protected. So all this create a scenario which is very worrying and which deserve um, uh, we, I could say an action from the trade union side first. And here there is a role that we have absolutely to play politically and concretely in the daily action. And so that's why it's, it's very important also to have uh, to, to, to liaise at a global level uh, amongst trade unions, but also with the institutions in order to face such uh, such hard situations. Thank you. And I love the connection you make to democracy because that is obviously uh, another crisis we are facing. We can speak clearly about that from the US and many other countries. Um, and that this is part of rebuilding uh, an inclusive uh, democracy. You cannot have violence. So that's a thank you for bringing that thread in um, as well as the complications in the EU um, uh, about uh, clarifying about ratification processes. Um, I wanna go over to, to Milagro, um, remind people, I know there's a robust conversation in the chat. You can also use the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen where we're gonna be coming to those questions very shortly. Milagro, we have lots of people, first of all, just congratulating uh, the Uruguayan movement for having such forward-leaning collective bargaining language 
language, the clauses. So just so you know, there is high demand on getting that collective bargaining language so we can all use it. So um, if you have, we'll make sure to get links in, into the, um, the chat box. But I wanna go um, back to the campaign in Uruguay and ask you, um, has the information on the ratification of the convention been made public? by the current government. Um, we've been hearing about this, this kind of gap between uh, rhetoric and then actually what's happening in countries. And so how, how are people learning about the ratification and what it means for their lives? What are the next steps in education um, by the government and the unions and employers? So over to you, Milagro. Bueno, eh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is clearly no. Now, the government is not doing anything, I'm afraid. As uh, you were saying, there's a lot of rhetoric. It says uh, that within the uh, collective bargaining agreement, there, there are going to be clauses about it. But uh, we had agreements uh, that were signed under the last governments. But we're, what we're doing now as trade union movement is uh, uh, workshops with uh, work with women workers and also educating and raising awareness among amongst the negotiators, uh, amongst the uh, those who deal with the collective bargaining agreements about the in inclusion of a uh, clauses against violence and harassment and uh, in, in the workplace, uh, referring, of course, uh, to uh, C-190. And we have a law that I was uh, telling you about, which is a law for the prevention in the workplace of uh, violence and harassment, uh, abuse and, and um, against women. So the, it's actually the trade union movement that has launched a campaign about it to uh, publicize, so to speak, this uh, law. Of course, it is more difficult now during the pandemic, but virtually we are organizing workshops, um, webinars, uh, also informing um, women workers uh, and, and men workers that um, are at the, that's sitting at the table with the employers to um, ensure that there's no violence or harassment at work. Um, and so I think, uh, what we have to do is uh, try uh, to ensure that the uh, that the C not 190 is uh, translated into measures, into actions, not only in, into clause clauses in agreements, but also um, make it true. So this is something that we have to uh, lobby the government about uh, because uh, this the uh, C-190 was approved at the parliament and that nothing happened. So what we're doing is um, trying from the uh, trade union movement. So um, it is actually us that are, that are, are doing all the, ra the awareness raising. Respondí tu pregunta. Yes, thank you. And I was just going to say, did I did I answer your question? Some best practices and the remaining challenges we have of a government that talks about it for one day and then moves on um, to the next issue as if this issue isn't part of the response to COVID, the response to um, to uh, all the crises uh, that our countries are facing. So a really good point the role of unions of constant mobilization and organizing to make sure that what is said uh, once <laughs> by a government gets effectively implemented. Um, Fiona, I wanna come back to you and, and just reminding me, Lagado, uh, lots of demands for any good language. We'll make sure to get that out. I know um, sisters from Unifor in Canada also interested in seeing that. Um, Fiona, over to you in, in Zimbabwe. And I think you really started to talk about um, this in in Zimbabwe has a long history of organizing uh, in the informal economy, making sure that all workers have power. What are some of the driving factors of violence and harassment um, for, for workers in, in Zimbabwe, in both uh, formal and informal, so that how is this convention really addressing those drivers? Thank you. Um, some of the drivers, uh, uh, the, the issue I say, the power issue, um, in fact, people that are social and economically powerful and some even politically powerful, 
they, they violate other people. Um, we have even had uh, incidences where some top uh, authorities have been accused of this kind of violence. And the informal workers particularly, they, 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 they work in, in, in open spaces most of the time. And their are, are, are issues, their rights are not even considered. And as a result, they can be harassed anytime and removed from the places where they are working, particularly during the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns last year. Um, these workers, were, they had their shelters uh, destroyed and they were chased away from where they were working. So their sources of livelihood are basically terminated and that's economic violence. And the police, they use their authority to beat up the, the, the informal workers as well. Instead of engaging them, they beat them up to chase them away from their spaces. So it's an issue of power and it's an issue of abuse of that power. And then sometimes because of poverty, some may end up succumbing to such uh, pressures because of poverty. And uh, in workplaces for the former workers, a, an employer may threaten you with dismissal. And some workers may end up succumbing to this pressure because they are afraid for their jobs. And some want to save their relationships at home. They don't want their husbands to hear that they have this kind of problem. Because of patriarchy, some husbands will immediately conclude that you invited it or something. So it's, it's a range of reasons, really. Thank you so much. And um, really important to look at the breadth of, of reasons and the fact that um, for so many years, this was just part of, as Krishanti has told us, part of the fabric of undervaluing work, um, the violence that accompanied that, and many, the failure of not having any protections of not being able to speak out um, and feeling like there was no um, legal frameworks, no remedies. So this is such an important step uh, to addressing that. Um, I want to go over to, um, to Krishanti, and then we're going to start um, getting some of the, the many questions I, I see coming in. And um, uh, Krishanti, um, can you provide some of examples of how the Center for Women's Global Leadership, which is based in the United States but works globally, is partnering with unions to forward this campaign? How are we building these really important alliances? Again, it cannot just be labor movement. This is this really we need a, a big movement to take this on. So we'd love to hear how that's happening. Krishanti. Thank you. And I think it's important to recognize that formally at a global level. Uh, violence against women as a human rights violation was only recognized in 1993, right? So what uh, ILO C-190 does is to help us propel, right? That discourse and the movement and the actions. So our collective actions, have they, it has to be multi-issue and cross-constituency if we are serious about the eradication. And I, in our work, I wanted to kind of break it down to three areas of with giving examples. Um, first of all, I have to thank Kathy, you and Chidi for inspiring me, right? Uh, because I met you two months after I got my job at, at the Center for Women's Global Leadership. And it's in that conversation at AFL-CIO, I felt like this is it. This is the place in which we can really globally contribute and bring um, our separate movements to work together around the eradication of gender-based violence. So we do international advocacy at the, at the UN level. So there were two things we did. One was um, we worked with the special rapporteur on contemporary forms of violence to address the role of gender in relation to contemporary forms of slavery, right? And in it, what we did was to work with um, International Domestic Worker Federation to have a round table and the special rapporteur actually did a report to the UN General Assembly on that. Uh, last year, one of the, the last things we did on um, 
March 13th, when we were shutting down New York, was to host the first expert group meeting, virtual meeting uh, ever that the UN has had with the special rapporteur on violence against women to address violence against women journalists. And the report came out last June, right? The second tier of our work was really to work with our partners. 16 days campaign to end gender-based violence is run in 187 countries, roughly among uh, uh, 6,000 plus organizations. Um, is to, uh, we did two things. One was as an institution, we prioritized the work on the eradication of violence in the world of work, really looking at it and bringing CEDAW together into that work. So uh, achieving substantive equality by addressing discrimination, harassment and violence in the world of work, right? So our portfolio is, 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 is that, right? And in that context with 16 days campaign, we worked with our core partners initially in 2017 to, to work with them to agree that we should, our theme should be the eradication of violence in the world of work, right? And then of course worked with most of you to the last three years, 2018 to 2020, to really address it. First, it was about the global ask for the ratification right then around the implementation and national ratification um, and very specifically last year we looked at informal workers violence and harassment in public spaces very specifically against informal workers and highlighted six sectors and there are 740 million women as informal workers and covid impacted uh, in relation to discrimination and harassment and violence in these public spaces, as well as the economic uh, violence that they face because they could not work. Um, the last thing that I wanted to bring up uh, in relation to addressing um, uh, the work around violence and wor working you know, across constituency wise is to really address violence and harassment in public spheres. And that is really about informal workers. So last December in nine uh, countries across uh, four regions, there were women informal workers who came together, right? And they contributed to developing a set of safety indicators for public spaces. So we are right now in the mix of doing that. And we are having actually a session next week on it um, to really get, because, Usually indicators are developed by experts somewhere in the global north in an office, right? What we wanted to do was to have the workers' voices integrated to really understand what does it mean for them to work on the ground in public spaces and what kind of safety measures do they want so that it is sustainable at a local level. And one of the things we haven't talked about is we have talked about national ratification, which is fundamental, right? But there's also local ordinances and legislation that can happen at a bottom up level. Now, United States never ratifies international treaties, hardly ever, uh, and they have not ratified the international treaty to, you know, CEDA, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. US is the only industrialized country not to ratify it, right? Uh, but, you know, 25 years ago in San Francisco, there was a bottom up, you know, strategy to ratify, to pass legislation on CEDA at a local level and shift the way actually um, labor was addressed, right? We worked with unions at that time. And now, so there are about 40 odd cities across the US who are looking to pass CEDA, right? But our hope is that we will integrate um, ILO C-190 into that conversation and strategy to really look at how cities ought to operate, you know, in relation to C-190. So those are a few examples, and I think it's really important um, kind of to mention that the women's organizations and movements cannot work on their own, just like, you know, unions can't do this on its own. And in order to really propel 
a proper recovery, it is fundamental that we come together because it is not a, it is not a luxury, it is not an afterthought, but it is a necessity and there's an inextricable link between the work of unions and worker organizations and women's rights movements. Thank you, Krishanti. And that is so true. If we want to have a recovery that is not returning, as we keep saying, to any normal that existed before that wasn't already working for working women. Um, so fantastic point. And I'm going to, um, before we open it up, we have a, our first intervention from the floor from Angelica Ordonez from the Women's Committee of Asuaz, the Union of Andean University in Ecuador. But I do want to just highlight one point that Krishanti made, Angelica, before turning it over to you, which is um, we're talking today about ratification at the national level. The U.S. government, that may not be the right strategy, as we heard. Uh, we haven't ratified many things. Um, and what is clear, and this is what we've seen with Convention 189 on domestic work, is how do you take the framework and use it as an organizing tool? So in the United States, we heard Krishanti's example. We have the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights moving at the state and local level. So I want to encourage all of us on this call both to be inspired by the national level fights and then also be inspired by the power building at the local level to use this framework in your communities, in your workplaces, and at the, the state uh, or provincial levels. Great point. Angelica, so wonderful to welcome you from Ecuador. Um, would love to hear about your experiences with the Convention 190. Over to you and then over to um, questions. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you for letting me speak here at the ITUC uh, meeting. Uh, we have challenges because we, uh, on January 17th, the Ecuadorian National Assembly unanimously ratified C-190 in Ecuador. And this ratification did not take us uh, by surprise. Um, we are part of the Public Service International National Committee, National Women's Committee in Ecuador, and we have been fighting for, for this ratification for over a year. Um, since August 2020, our delegates met with several government organizations, unions, scholars, and assembly representatives to lobby for C-190 ratification. We had a total of six meetings and we used also social media, Twitter, to make our voices heard and present our statement, ratify C-190 now. The path for women's right does, rights does not have a finish line. It is a journey. And while in PSI Ecuador, we are thrilled to acknowledge the C-190 ratification, we know this is just the starting point. First, we are still waiting for the official document to be sent to the ILO uh, headquarters. And we're watching and we're, we will hold accountable um, the Foreign Affairs Office to, do, to finish this paperwork as soon as possible. We are in the middle of political instability and we are in an electoral context too. After being sent to the ILO, we have to wait 12 months for the C-190 to be fully applicable in our country. So at home, we will have to fight in public institutions and private workplaces to incorporate the C-190 into their regulations immediately. Union, unions can do a lot at this point. Every negotiation counts. Workers of Ecuador will have to unite and demand the implementation of the C-190. Moreover, from our unions, we must build up the protocols that derive from the C-190 definitions, recommendations, and norms. These protocols will frame our workplace relations. However, our unions will also have to fight to protect every worker, regardless of their contract conditions, to live and work without violence and harassment. Finally, we will have to continue a revolution for cultural transformation that replaces unequal and violent relations for social relationships based on care and justice ethics everywhere. In Ecuador, C-190 must compete with a recently approved governmental initiative to prevent violence and harassment at the workplace. Sadly, this directive does not include the adv advancements, sorry, C-190 proposes. This, uh, the workers that sue for violence will be asked to have a reconciliatory meeting with the aggressor 
before proceeding with the demand. Also, the whole procedure will be led by, by labor ministry officials who are not familiar with a gender perspective. This means what several laws against women's violence have meant for society. We have the rules, but we do not have the institutions and the officials to enforce them properly from a human rights and gender approach, making our workplaces accountable for the implementations of the C-190 will take years of hard work and an assertive attitude in our unions. From our organizations, we must be constant, relentless, and consistent to succeed. Love it. Constant and, and forward-leaning and movement building to succeed. Angelica, thank you so much for your, your intervention and for sharing the experiences in Ecuador. Again, I think we're hearing common experiences, even in countries where you get the ratification process moving, um, that there is a gap to effective implementation. And that is why this is a long-term strategy. Um, I think we're in it for the long, long haul. We know as a, as a movement, it takes a long time to do transformative change. So let me get to some of the questions um, and people should feel free. I'll just have some of the panelists say who wants to intervene. I believe we've addressed the EU question, um, but Silvana, I'll see if there's other questions. Let me just do a few um, of the um, questions and then you can choose. Um, there's some questions from uh, France and from Senegal about, um, you know, the, many of the countries we're talking about that had ratification, they want to know um, how many had actual changes in, in national law? Um, how many of these countries also already had existing legislation around domestic violence? Um, and we have the example um, in Senegal, the law criminalizing rape passed by 38 civil society organizations. Um, and that was a foundation upon which they uh, had this movement to advocate for the ratification of Convention 190. And this is from our sister um, from the CCNE in, in Senegal. So what kind of um, laws actually may have already existed that facilitated this? Um, that is one question um, I will throw out. And then uh, if people want to uh, deal with those questions and then um, I have a really good question that I think we need to all ask ourselves as a movement. And then I'm gonna turn it over to the panel. What are we doing as a labor movement to address uh, these issues in our own structures and structures that we know are often male dominated? Um, how are we bringing the C-190 commitments into our own union workplaces, um, into our own structures so that this is actually part of our own transformation as a movement? So starting with those questions, you can uh, jump in. Why don't we start first? Let me make sure, have we answered the EU question, Silvana? Any pending questions around what has to happen in the EU? Yes, I, I think that I shall take your second question now because I, I already said what was my opinion on the uh, ratification. So I, I think that as a, a movement, we have much to do internally and uh, we could say externally, which is not exactly externally. Internally, because it's uh, obvious that uh, the item regarding the violence is very wide and it does regard also the fact that many positions are more difficult for uh, women to be reached. And uh, if we have a more representation of women in uh, uh, the uh, leader points also within the trade union movement, uh, we shall have uh, um, more correct representation also of uh, the, the, um, uh, the subjects, the items, the problems, the needs. So there is a problem of representations. And here, I, I, um, the experience uh, shows that uh, the rules, the internal rules uh, are uh, very important on that, the anti-discriminatory rules. So I don't, uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the quotas uh, just uh, uh, simply, but about the anti-discrimination rules, uh, which can really uh, be a, a tool against uh, the violence. Then I mean with the practice, practice in terms of the negotiation, because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something that is linked also uh, on the organization. Uh, it's, uh, I, I take again uh, the issue that uh, you were raising about the link between implementation of the convention and uh, 
uh, increasing of the organization amongst the workers. Indeed, uh, we uh, interpret, as in the force of our mandate, we interpret also the needs of our, our members. So uh, there is, uh, uh, again, the representation and the protection that we can ensure through the negotiation at different levels. And here we have many examples. Uh, in Italy, we have examples in the private sector, but also in the public sector with specific agreements made between the uh, trade unions and uh, the uh, different associations. And that specifically on violence or on uh, uh, different types of uh, harassment and uh, discriminations. So we have to widen these forms of, uh, uh, of negotiations uh, um, to, um, uh, to, to allow at the same time to best represent and uh, uh, recognize protection on specific rights. Of, uh, of the women, uh, especially of women in the workplace, not only, but especially. <laughs> thank, thank you, Silvana. And I know we're, we're down to our final 10 minutes, so, but I'm going to go back to the panelists to um, sort of address some of the questions. I don't, do we want to go to Mirai? Do you want to talk about in Fiji? Did you have existing laws, um, domestic violence laws? Did that make it easier for ratification? And then um, uh, what are some of the, if we look inward to the labor movement in Fiji, what are some of the issues? Has this helped create more space to talk about um, gender-based violence within our own movement? Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, yes, we do have uh, the Domestic Violence Act here in Fiji. Uh, we also have um, uh, the the Employment Relations Act uh, that uh, deals with, but not exclusively about violence and harassment at the, uh, at the in the world of work. So that is something that we are looking at the uh, the amendments uh, to the Employment Relations Act to have. Um, uh, to be compliant uh, with the provisions uh, and the articles of the uh, conventions, uh, the Convention 190, sorry, uh, that um, we believe uh, as a movement, uh, as a, the union movement, uh, the work really begins um, uh, at the uh, at, a, at the membership level, where we must uh, educate uh, our members on this um, important uh, convention. Uh, we should have uh, awareness uh, campaigns, really, and and we're looking at that. The FTUC is uh, looking at doing that uh, at the affiliate level. Um, the Fiji Trade Union Congress is the umbrella body, but what we're looking at doing is uh, going down to the affiliate level and. Uh, Educating our, our membership on this uh, on this very important convention. Now, just uh, I just I, I wanted to share this. Uh, I work for the National Union of Workers. It's an affiliate of uh, the Fiji Trade Union Congress. I work as the senior industrial relations officer. And uh, just uh, two months ago, uh, I had a member that uh, came to the office. She had faced um, harassed. Uh, she was harassed by uh, one of her uh, superiors. So uh, she didn't uh, uh, have the courage to raise it. Uh, uh, with uh, with one of our bosses, so she came directly to me the next day and uh, and said, "This is what had happened. Uh, this is what transpired," and she and she wanted to just uh, uh, leave work. So I told her, "Okay, look, I'm going to um, email your uh, managers, your superiors, and and tell them that this is we do not condone this. Uh, this is not acceptable." Um, I did that and. Um, I sent an email out. I received a, a positive response uh, from the management. They said that they were going to uh, look into it. They do not uh, condone uh, any uh, the forms of harassment or bullying in the workplace. So the good thing was uh, the following week, uh, there was an announcement in the intercom uh, in uh, the, uh, the company uh, that uh, there, there was a message that was going on that they do not uh, condone uh, any forms of bullying in the workplace, any forms of harassment. Uh, and yeah, it went on for a week and it's still going on. I'm still in touch with the members. They say that that, that announcement goes on and on uh, during breaks. And uh, so, yeah, and, and if they face any types of uh, bullying or uh, violence or harassment, they have to raise it uh, with their superiors. So I'm um, starting to see that there are a few changes uh, coming in uh, from the employers. 
So uh, for us as a movement, it's all about uh, educating our membership um, about the convention and that they, that they shouldn't fear victimization. And if there are any issues to raise it uh, with us and um, yeah, hopefully we can create a safer space, a safe working space uh, for women and enabling them to reach uh, higher goals in their career. So. Great. I love the concrete example and I love the uh, education. It's going to come down to really needing to go into our membership and educate. All right. We have the challenge, sisters. We're in our final minutes here. I'm going to go to um, Fiona, then um, Milagro, and then Krishanti to wrap us up. We've got a couple minutes, each person, to give some final um, input on um, existing laws that you had, um, uh, issues within the labor movement to really ground this work and transform our own structures. Fiona, over to you. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to answer, uh, the, there was one person that uh, one person asked, what can we do as trade unions? We need to be on the forefront of this fight. We need to educate and sensitize our workers. We also need to participate and lobby for workplace uh, policies that um, uh, protect workers from violence and harassment. And not just formulate the policies but also monitor the enforcement or implementation of those policies. We also need to utilize the social dialogue platform so that at national level, we can actually influence policy change at national level. And we are also supposed to be right on the forefront of monitoring the abuses, encouraging people to report and attending to those uh, issues, also referring uh, those issues to professionals that can provide counseling. I want to say if we engage men and also sensitize them, we can reach a headway. We can develop gender champions, male gender champions that can also advocate for equality and non-violence. In Zimbabwe, we have uh, targeted male gender champions and we had those um, champions trained by the ITUC on the convention itself so that they can understand and be able to articulate it as well. And this can also help to spread the word to everyone. That's what I just wanted to say. Thank you. Love that, Fiona. Men, uh, gender champions. Obviously, we cannot correct this imbalance of power, address power, if we do not bring in um, our, our brothers as allies. Thank you. Um, Milagro, your final um, points, please, from your great I would think that as a conclusion, it would be important to say that, uh, uh, well, it is important to have this kind of uh, debates and uh, to join forces. Many women have not had uh, the opportunity to reach leadership positions and to make changes, effective changes. So what is important is to hear the voices of all those women that do not have a, a, a voice. It is important that at the trade union level, we should work on machism. Uh, we must try to work with, ma with our male um, uh, friends and not work against them. I think it is important uh, that uh, more and more women lead, lead uh, reach rather leadership uh, to leadership, leadership positions, but it is also important to work with men workers, with colleagues, so that they understand what, um, um, discrimination is, what the macho language is, and um, what sex, sex, sexism is. I think it is important uh, to do it with the empathy and sensitive uh, voices that we all women have, with this empathy. It is important to eradicate machism and also discrimination and violence against women, of course. But so it all goes through, it, or it, it, all, it will all require education and transformation of both men and women. Thank you all, because it was a pleasure to, to talk to your beautiful women. I love it. More women in decision-making, negotiation, and representation positions. Absolutely. And we need uh, education, education. That's what we're hearing in education, ed educating our members, our brothers who are in the movement with us. Um, so important. Krishanti, bring us home with some final comments. 
Okay, thank you. I mean, when we think about equality, even in the world of work, right? It, it is important to, now we are really talking about the eradication of gender-based violence. It is also connected to sexual and reproductive rights of women. So labor is inextricably linked to safety and sex, access to sexual and reproductive rights. So if you are to look at that framework, one of the things, one of the frameworks that allows us to really holistically address women's labor, right, is the human rights framework, right? And that human rights framework, and I think there's an ongoing conversation that is happening where we need to connect what is happening in the labor movement to the human rights movement. Right. So there are a few examples and there's already quite a bit of work that is happening that we need to pay attention to. Uh, Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women has put out many reports during the last few years around ending violence against women politicians, you know, uh, addressing um, online violence. Uh, addressing violence against women journalists and her port, and then she does country visits. And that work, I think, has to be connected to the work uh, of the labor movement, right? And really taking those recommendations when we are trying to ratify at a national level, right? ILO C190. Uh, there was an extraordinary report done and a lot of work that went into the future of work that the UN um, Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls have done. And their work is very thorough and comprehensive. And again, those recommendations, I think, need to come into play. And of course, the CEDAW, the convention, right? Because that frames the art. Uh, kind of the argument around equality and non-discrimination. And our work, while we actually, during the 16 days campaign work um, from uh, November 25th to December 10th, because those are the 16 days we try to amplify the work around the eradication of violence against women, the work is never done. It has to happen 365 days of the year. And when we talk about ma male allies, as well as expanding uh, our network, it is very important to recognize that this is about awareness as well as accountability, because we will not be able to eradicate violence in the world of work without bringing awareness in relationship to accountability. And I hope we can work together in days to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. This has been um, for me the best way to start my morning here in Washington, DC. I know it's afternoon and evening for sisters in, in Fiji and, and in other countries, but what I wanna thank everybody on this panel and everyone who's been having the conversation in the chat. It is phenomenal what you are doing during a time of crisis, you are proving the power of organizing, the power of building bridges between movements, the feminist, women's, human rights movements, and the fact that um, we have taken a first step to winning, to building this framework, and now um, we are dedicating our, our, our focus on continuing to build power in our communities and our workplaces to hold governments, employers accountable, our own, our own movement accountable, to finally eliminating gender-based violence in our communities and in our workplaces. Thank you for all the work you all do. Um, you continue to inspire us uh, to keep on organizing, continue to mobilize, and I encourage everyone um, to check out the resources at, on the International Trade Union Confederation website. The Center for Women's Global Leadership also has um, information, and I know we're all going to be going uh, back to some of the panelists to get your best practices on collective bargaining language and um, some of the, the laws and um, ab uh, lobbying efforts that you all have done. Thank you. Mil gracias. Everyone have a great day, and I look forward to continuing to work with you to eliminate gender-based violence in the world of work. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.